Welcome back friends. In today's video, we'll take a look at the most important script in my RPG game, the XP command server. But first, allow me to present the progress I've been making on the game. Most of the core game loop has been in place for quite a while, but lately I've been refactoring much of it. The final sections in need of a refactor are the game menu and the battle system. Since the previous video tutorial, I've managed to refactor the inventory, skill tree, and equipment menus. Next, I'll start working on the synthesis menu where players can create new items and place new stat boosting effects on equipment. I'm aiming to have a majority of the game menu recoded by the next Patreon update. I've also been experimenting with the visual style of the game. On Twitter, I took notice of the 256 FPS challenge. This is a challenge to make a 3D model with only 256 polygons and a 256 by 256 pixel texture. I really fell in love with the style of a few of the entries, so much so that I made a 256 polygon version of Violet, my game project's demo character, and it was a ton of fun. Because my game is an attempt to turn back time and go back to the golden age of JRPGs, I think the retro style might actually fit well. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Now let's get on to the subject at hand. In the previous tutorial, we covered the XP registry. The XP command server and the XP registry are very similar. The difference is, instead of providing global access to an object's variables as the registry does, the command server provides global access to an object's functionality. In a nutshell, objects, like our dialog player, are responsible for registering their services and functionality with the command server. In turn, the command server acts as a safe intermediate between objects that provide functionality and objects that request functionality. Let's use our dialog player as an example. If we want objects in our game world to be able to use the dialog player's functionality, then the dialog player needs to register that service with the command server. When the dialog player enters the scene tree, we'll use the command server's register object function. The purpose of this function is to create a nickname for this object in the global space that all other objects can refer to when requesting services from this object. It takes two parameters, a reference to the object and the object's new global nickname. Let's also not forget to unregister this object when it leaves the scene tree. Once our dialog player object is known to the command server, it can register its functionality and services. In this case, we want objects in our game world to be able to request that a dialog be played. We can do this via the command server's register command function. The register command function potentially requires up to five parameters. A reference to the calling object, a function that will be called when the functionality is requested, the object's global nickname, the name of the command that specifies this specific service the object can provide, and a dictionary detailing the potential parameters that might be passed along with the service request. The command server can validate these parameters when a request is made to ensure objects have all of the correct information they need to provide a service. At this point, any object in our game world can trigger a dialog to be played via the command server's execute functions. To trigger a dialog, you pass an execute function up to four parameters. First, the dialog player's global nickname, command name, an optional dictionary containing all of the required parameters, and an optional yield signal. An optional yield signal can be provided if you want to wait for a command to be completed before moving to the next command. For the yield signal to work, the object which emits the yield signal must register and unregister the signal with the command server when it enters and exits the scene tree. The register signal and unregister signal functions can be used to accomplish this. The yield signal's data is returned from the execute function, which can then be used to pause the function until the signal is emitted. And that's it. 
Let's review with a quick bird's eye view of what it takes to trigger a dialogue event in my RPG. When the dialogue player enters the scene tree, it registers itself, its services, and the necessary signals with the command server. An object in the game world can trigger a dialogue event by making a request to the command server. The command server validates the request and forwards it to the dialogue player, and also returns data about the yield signal, which pauses the requesting script. The dialogue player plays the requested dialogue, then emits the dialogue finished signal, which frees the calling script to continue executing commands. Let's take a look at a few examples from the actual game code in my game project. This is the script that I made in the previous tutorial demonstrating the XP registry. It triggers a dialogue which displays the player character's current HP. As we see here, triggering dialog events is far from the only use of the command server. Before making a request to the dialog player, this script first makes a request to the avatar system to mute the input events, preventing the player from moving around while the dialog event is playing. Once the player is immobilized, the script makes a second request to the dialog player via the command server to play a dialog record named dialog player forward slash test forward slash white egg and also request the data necessary to yield the script until the dialog player is finished playing. Only after the dialog player emits the finished signal, the final request to unmute the avatar's input events is made, giving control of the avatar back to the player. The XP command server is the backbone that holds the entire game together, whether it's inserting treasure chest loot into inventories, awarding the player with a newly earned skill, or changing the background music, all of the game's modules and systems rely on it. But let's zoom back into the dialogue player system for a moment. Requests to the command server aren't limited to scripts. The nodes in the dialogue editor can also contain requests to the command server. Here's one such example. When the dialogue player comes to this node in the dialogue chain, the screen will fade to black, the avatar will teleport to a predetermined location, then the screen will fade back in. Inside the game, it looks like this. Pretty nifty. The command server also runs perhaps the second most important script in the game, the module class. In fact, the entirety of the game is made up of instances of the module class. In the next tutorial, we'll be talking about how my Godot RPG is split up into modules that have the ability to gracefully transition between one another. If you don't want to miss it, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Speaking of graceful transitions, if you want to be a part of the Godot RPG's development, head over to the Dave the Dev community Patreon page, link below. For patrons in the developer tier and above, I upload my entire Godot project file on the 5th of every month and highlight the important changes I've made. All patrons gain access to the Dave the Dev community Discord server, where you can go to get a little help in your own Godot projects. And speaking of patrons, I want to give a special shout out to Gothi, the first patron of the Dave the Dev community, Congratulations and thank you so much for your support. If you're interested in surreal horror games, you can find Gothi on Twitter at Eclectia Games, link below. Well, that does it for this tutorial. Tune in next time to hear about how my RPG is made from modules. Hope to see you there. Until then, happy devving.